Just Seen It is brought to you by Short Order and Shortcake, located in the original farmer's market at the corner of 3rd and Fairfax. On this episode of Just Seen It, we review the sci-fi thriller, Dread. Choose is the manufacturing base for all the slow-mo in Mega City One. You know how often we get a judge up in peace truth? It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it knows the wheel, and it does it well. From director Paul Thomas Anderson, The Master. You seem to inspire something in him. What we will do now will urge you toward existence within a group. You know, I was actually, I was hoping it'd be a masterpiece, much like all PTA movies. ABC's country musical drama, Nashville. Why does she have to go to work? Somebody's got to work around here. I thought we were rich. We're just a different kind of rich called cash poor. They gave all the characters something to do, but it's just the concept we've seen before. Of and the suspense horror, VHS. Okay, here's the deal. We're going to break into this house, and all we have to do is steal this one VHS tape. All these actors look like real people, and that's my favorite part of the indie world. All right here on Just Seen It. Dredd is one of the most feared cops in a post-apocalyptic metropolis. Only one thing fighting for order in the chaos. The men and women of the Hall of Justice. When a powerful new drug hits the streets, Dredd and his team try to stop its spread. Peace Trees is the manufacturing base for all the slow-mo in Mega City One. Rookie, you ready? But when a vicious drug lord discovers his plan... I want him dead. ...an all-out urban war ignites in... Dredd. Hi, I'm Leah. I'm Sean. And I'm the law. Sorry, Salim. No, you can't. I just did that voice. It was Sylvester Sloan voice. You did, like, some Batman voice. You know what? This isn't Batman. <laughs> this is Dread 3D. Mm -hmm. We've all just seen it. Salim, you want to fill us in on this? Yeah, sure. The character Judge Dredd is actually based off of a pretty famous British comic book. And, of course, we all know the wonderfully amazing 90s version of Judge Dredd with the beautiful Sylvester Sloan and his awesome blue eyes. I kind of wanted to hate this movie, because there's an endless supply of puns associated with me giving my final verdict on this movie. <laughs> it was dreadful. It filled me with dread. I dreaded the experience. Guess what? <laughs> I liked it. Oh! Oh, snap! I liked the movie. It was written by Alex Garland, who wrote 28 Days Later and Never Let Me Go. Sunshine. Sunshine. Mm -hmm. eh, I didn't like that so much. But you get, you get talented people to do stuff for you, and sometimes it sometimes. pays off. I mean, there's no character development in this movie. It doesn't go into its futuristic world at mm -hmm. all. It doesn't really explain its concept of, of what's going on or how the world operates or what the whole justice system is where mm -hmm. people are acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Mm -hmm. But it's a simple concept an action movie premise that's basically a descendant of Die Hard. It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it knows the wheel, and it does it well. Carl Urban, the person who plays Judge Dredd, he's like, all right, this version of Dredd, the helmet is staying on the entire movie because that was a very big part of the comic series. So we have Olivia Thurlby, who plays his you know, rookie cop who he has to kind of show on the first day on the job, and she's kind of the emotional core. She's kind of the person who we have character development from. This movie really knows what it wants to be. It is a straightforward cops versus drug dealers mm -hmm. action movie, and it pulls no punches, and therefore it doesn't take itself too seriously. It does adhere to the die-hard kind of premise. You know, all of this action takes place in this one location in this big, tall building. Mm -hmm. There is extreme graphic violence in this film, and there is no social yeah. critique, and so, unfortunately, that renders a lot of the violence kind of pointless, mm -hmm. and then you realize that is the point. It is, look at what I can do with special effects, and as long as you're okay with that, you're good. But mm -hmm. they, the writer does do a good job of peppering it with this gallows humor, yeah. which tones down some of that graphic violence. What was great about that is that they didn't take themselves too seriously. Right. It was actually quite funny. It was deadpan humor, which is they, making fun of itself. There are these kind of camp elements where mm -hmm. the movie is really kind of very conscious of oh. what it is doing. Exactly. What did you all think of Carl Urban's performance? You mentioned that he was committed to wearing the helmet the whole time. Mm -hmm. Carl Urban's been good in bad movies. I yeah. mean, he was in Doom. Certainly, he came from Lord of the Rings, which you know people love. But he came from you know he's, he's he was Bones. He in was Bones Star in Star Trek. Trek. You're right. Chronicles of Riddick. Chronicles of Riddick. So mm -hmm. this guy, he, he's a good actor. 
I know that the, the helmet thing is, is very important, especially to Judge Dredd fans. I mean, it was a major criticism of the Stallone picture. I get it, but at the same time, I, it, it, he feels so stuck behind that mask that mm. he really is just kind of this emotionless, robotic right. figure. Right. And Carl Urban is fine. He does exactly what he's called on to do, but I really wish that we could have gotten to know this guy a little bit more than the movie gives us. He is robotic. He is a little kind of one note, but he really sells it on the physicality. He sells me on the action. He uses his weapons mm -hmm. very well. Olivia Thurlby, who plays Anderson, the rookie, she won't wear a helmet, <laughs> and, you know, and they have a very cute exchange about whether to wear the helmet or not. I thought she was great, especially because near the end of the movie, she's not just this damsel in distress who's waiting for Dredd to save her. Thank God. Thank God. We have Lena Hetty playing Mama, a former prostitute who emerges as the queen pin of a drug empire in this housing development. I've been a fan of hers ever since I saw her in the Sarah Connor Chronicles in 300. I thought she was a great leading lady, but we've seen her kind of take a turn since Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Now she's this villain, and whoa, she can play the villain very well. Pete Travis is the director here. We last saw him with Vantage Point. Mm. He does a really good job here. It's clear that he knows style, that he knows spectacle, he knows scale. But I do think that there are moments where he lingers yeah. lovingly way too long on some of his special effects. And it's yeah. like, you know what? I want to see the explosions. I don't want to see the trail of smoke afterwards. And I did feel that this movie, yes, it is stylistic, but I don't think that it relishes its style as much as a lot of the movies mm -hmm. we see today. I agree, yeah. I thought it was great the way they introduced the idea of this drug called the slow-mo drug. They really write this into the movie from the very beginning. Everything's all slow motion, so it looks really cool. So it, it helps aesthetically, but it also really is a driving force for the story. Dread in 3D is not a perfect film, but it is enjoyable. However, with the extreme graphic violence, I do think watching it at home will tone it down a little bit. So stream it. Well, it's nothing new under the sun, but Dread knows its concept and it works as visual spectacle. So I'm gonna say see it. A violent, action-packed, slow-mo thrill ride. Definite see it. All right, cheers. 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 I'm the law. Freddy is an alcoholic drifter dealing with the trauma of World War II. You want to get the lights back? How did I get down here? You're acting aggressive because you're drinking too much alcohol. By chance, he meets Lancaster, the charismatic leader of the cause. But above all, I am a man, just like you. <laughs> as Freddy adheres to Lancaster's religious teachings, the cult center circle sees him as a threat. He will be our undoing if we continue to have him here. In The Master. Hi, I'm Greg Carver. I'm Rachel Applebaum. Salim Lamel. And we're here to talk about Paul Thomas Anderson's long-awaited follow-up to There Will Be Blood, The Master. We've all just seen it, Salim. This movie was among his weaker films, and the reason why it wasn't as good is because it, it never really felt like it got going. It doesn't have a, a great through line in terms of narrative structure, and it, it, it doesn't really want to be coherent, which you kind of start seeing as the movie goes on. It's really about human emotion and the extremes of human emotion. Yes. <laughs> so about that, I feel like also, yes, it doesn't have a clear plot. What is this movie trying to do? Mm -hmm. And they even have a scene where there's sort of like this, this standoff between Joaquin Phoenix's character and Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, where the two of them are supposed to be butting heads. It's supposed to be this tear-jerking scene where you feel bad that they can't be together. But the movie hasn't really set it up for me that there's that this is a climactic scene. No, you made you the truth. They are predictable. Just, I know you're trying to calm me down, but just say something that's true! I just wanted a little bit more. I felt like this was sort of a light meal. I mm -hmm. wanted some steak. You think okay. the master was a light meal? <laughs> I do. I think it sets out to be steak and it presents you with salad. You know, after I watched this movie and mm -hmm. really thinking about like, all those scenes that you're telling me about, mm -hmm. there's one in particular where he just starts, he sees people naked yep. randomly. And again, I didn't, I didn't get that scene. I didn't, I realized what this guy was from the very beginning, that he's this repressed dude who all he thinks about is sex. It's all he wants, but he can't get it because 
Lancaster thinks it's an animalistic tendency, right. you realize it just keeps making him worse and worse. Well, all... yeah, but you have this naked scene, and first of all, it's not clear whose eyes you're seeing the scene. It's very clear it's that we're seeing it like Joaquin when you realize eyes. This <laughs> close, we do a close cut to Joaquin Phoenix, yeah. Yeah. and then uh, of his eyes, and then we match cut to a fantasy sequence of the room. Yeah. yeah That's but very clear that we're seeing it from his perspective. If you're <laughs> seeing it from his perspective, are you seeing it that he's repressed and he wants yeah. access to these women? I mean, a lot of things. Again, he, it's he, a ten minute scene, mm -hmm. and it's not really, you know, guiding you in any direction. The movie but, doesn't take you by the head and show you and no, tell you this is the then, meaning, this is what you're supposed right, to see. but mm -hmm. it feels, again, it just feels gratuitous. I think this movie is about two characters who are wrong for each other. Completely. Who, who yes. will exacerbate the problems in each other's lives, but who are drawn to each other mm -hmm. by, by their inherent natures and by their relationships, and they both so strongly want something to happen, but they're, they're bad for each other. And I think that there are... There's so much in this movie. I think the imagery is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I think that the directing is so confident and so precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy Adams' character, her like dynamic with Philip Seymour Hoffman, that part of the story works for me. And that, mm -hmm. there's a lot of subtext there, and I get that. Sort of the elephant in the room here is Scientology. Lancaster's very clearly L. Ron Hubbard. You see this in almost every facet of the, of the movie. Auditing. Auditing is called processing. Being uh, clear is called being a perfect. The whole movie is mapped perfectly onto Scientology. Just different titles different, and names. The names have been changed to protect the guilty. If this is a movie about cults, and if it is a movie about Scientology, then they've picked the most benign era to show. They haven't showed you the beginning, the invention, and how manipulative that is, and they're not showing you the evils along the way and as much of the corruption to the point where it's at right now. Well, that's a great point to transition into the acting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I felt like the acting in this movie was phenomenal. So yeah. like, I can't really think of a better word than incredible and, and amazing, because the, both of these guys, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix, they, they, they try to outdo each other in just about every scene. Joaquin Phoenix is he has this anguish this pain and yeah. there were times where I really couldn't even understand what he was saying because he was jump you know he was kind of just you know yeah and it was yeah. something wrong with his his you know speech he had a speech impediment yeah. exactly and I, and I and I just thought that was incredible there are times when I'm almost too aware of these two hmm. men as actors, where you're watching Philip Seymour Hoffman and you know he's having this moment where he puts his hand out and he's going, as an actor, I am relishing it. And we kind of relish it along with him. I thought the acting was amazing and completely immersive. And I think Joaquin Phoenix is completely unrecognizable in mm -hmm. this role. And I think it's something we haven't seen mm -hmm. before from him. And I don't think it, in any moment you're drawn out. I think, in fact, I'm constantly drawn in and I'm wondering what is the interior mind of this character and I'm so yeah. fascinated by yeah. what are these people thinking. I mean, I, I've got that in moments. Like when the scene is really sharp, like, like the, um, the moment where he's going through processing. When you are in processing, what comes to you is always right. Always right. Always good. Always helpful. Will always lead you toward the pain. Well, we're orbiting around it. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the director, Paul sure. Thomas Anderson. We know PTA makes emotional movies, and this one is no different. Similar to There Will Be Blood, this one just really has a great emotional resonance with these characters because they're just they're they're so interesting. Well, it reminded me of something that Robert Town, the writer of Chinatown, said mm -hmm. about that movie, and he said it was the first noir that was composed entirely of the shoe leather of the scenes that were in between the scenes mm -hmm. in most noirs. Interesting. And I certainly think the masters like that. A disjointed plot is saved by some amazing performances. See it. This is a half-developed story with very developed acting. I give it a stream it. This is an amazing movie by a great filmmaker. See it, see it, see it. Cheers, mates. Well, this review was just Cheers. masterful. <laughs> Our download pick of the week is the new Blu-ray release of Indiana Jones, The Complete Adventures. My favorite, of course, is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wait, no, sorry. That's Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But regardless, this box set looks and sounds fantastic with lots of extra goodies. You can actually get rid of the fourth movie. <laughs> sorry, Steven. And Raiders is playing in IMAX right now for a limited time. Also out this week, we have Cabin in the Woods, which we gave a stream it, and The Magic of Belle Isle, which we gave a see it. You can check out all of our reviews at justseenit.com. Thanks. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Liz. I'm Teresa. I'm Rachel. And we're going to travel down south to review the newest pilot coming out of ABC, Nashville. We've all just seen it. Rachel, how about you give us the rundown now, you hear? Well, this show was created by Callie Curry. It stars Connie Britton and Hayden Panettiere. And it's mediocre, I feel. <laughs> It's very mediocre, and to the writer's credit is that they gave all the characters something to do, but it's just the concept we've seen before of this old starlet battling this young starlet in Nashville, and it's just, it's just tired. It's, it lacks magic. It's the country version of Smash, and so though, you know, there's an evil girl and a good girl, and Smash is more focusing on process, I think that they wanted to take up and co-op that market to make this show. It's just like Country Strong, where an old starlet battles a young starlet. In Nashville, it's just the same story, and in that movie, it was boring as well, even though you can tell it's a high-quality movie. I always harp on this, but specificity helps. Yeah. If the show was in Nashville, put more Nashville in it. And every single character in the show is a singer, practically, which I know cannot be the case. The first half of the pilot, I think, was slightly enjoyable because mm -hmm. you have good casting and interesting situations. But in the second half, I think what you're alluding to is these horrible expositional scenes. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's moments where you have, tell me, would you change anything in your life? Nothing. Everything. I mean, how many <laughs> movies is that line in? I was just like, no, take that. Take that out. What's funny about that is that that is a typical thing of a nighttime soap, which mm -hmm. this is, mm -hmm. but they didn't go campy enough, and that's their main problem, is they try to take this really serious way of their writing, but they didn't have enough fun with it, and I think that was another problem. It's just it's not fun. My mama was one of your biggest fans. She said she'd listen to you while I was still in her belly. Well, that is a charming story. You probably got to go on soon. I'm sure you're going to want to make sure you got those girls tucked in there real good. <laughs> <laughs> the singer dynamic, I think, really works. The old singer and the young singer. There's some good cattiness there, and if you're, you know, if that's what you're looking for, that does work. One of the supporting characters, Scarlett, which was played by Claire Bowen, was really weak. I mean, the actress who played her, she just seemed very uncomfortable on screen, where she noticeably, I could tell she was trying to act. She has a song that she doesn't know is a song because she only writes poems. She doesn't realize they could be set right. to music. She very adamantly yes. writes poetry. I'm not a songwriter. She I says just, it about three times. I, I just moved to Nashville to write poetry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, shut up. You I know, work in the back of for singer-songwriters and country and then, music. Exactly. And then her knight in shining armor is like, well, this would be really good if we put it to music. And he's like, I happen to play he, guitar. He picks his guitar out and right. he starts playing. And he's like, does it sound like this? Like, like how would you know what so someone knows? Because they're made for each other, Rachel. Why don't you understand? But I do think we have actually some really good actors. If Connie Britton and Hayden Panettiere were not in this drama, then this would not be an interesting show. And the, and the two of them, their dynamic is the only thing that keeps this show afloat. Be nice. Oh, I'm always nice. Oh, be extra nice. And this benefits me how? It's not for you, it's for the label. And Connie is wonderful. She's playing this character who is, you know, vulnerable and, and sort of blind to her own faux pas and mistakes but now she's being humbled, and she does a, you know, she does a really layered job of that. I really enjoyed Chip Aston, who played Deacon Claiborne. He's actually from the Drew Carey show. He's from Whose Line Is It Anyway? He's, he's known for a lot of comedy, and he's been, uh, you know, bit parts in various drama series throughout the past decade, but he was an interesting, sympathetic male yeah. character, mm -hmm. and he wasn't cut and dry, and he played it with a lot of heart. He so was I'm... rugged but warm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was great. He was a perfect actor for that role, and a very interesting choice. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I was the future of country music. You're not some overnight sensation. No, you are sensational overnight, to the best of my recollection. In terms of directing and production values, I do have to applaud this show because you get to see <laughs> Connie Britton's wrinkles and Connie Britton's puffy eyes, and they really push the age issues and the yeah. perils of growing old in this industry. Uh, and they show the physical effects or the physical reflections of someone who's a little bit older. I mean, there's no whitewashing it. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. which you know what is something I have like hardly ever seen before. I never see wrinkles. It was refreshing. I like to see wrinkles. <laughs> so you're telling me after 21 years at this label, if I don't open for your little ingenue who wouldn't make it as one of my backup singers, that you're not going to support me? Still, I need to know your decision. Well, you can kiss my decision as it's walking out the door. The show was, it was okay, but it could get better. Stream it. I agree with you, it's not that good. <laughs> but I really love the cast and I love the subject matter, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my faith in it and I'm gonna say, stream it. It's a decent show, Connie and Hayden are great. It's a soap with a different background, it's set in Nashville, stream it. Well, looks like our votes add up to one and a half tickets, which is an enthusiastic stream it for 
Bash Pro. Cheers! To being okay! To being alright! Okay, here's the deal. We gotta break into this house, and all we have to do is steal this one VHS tape. A group of misfits are hired to burglarize a desolate house. Their mission is to retrieve a rare videotape. Which one is it? I don't know, man. But when they break in, they find a dead body and much more than they bargained for. In VHS. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm Liz. I'm Rachel. And if you're watching this footage, it probably means we're all dead. <laughs> but even so, we should probably still talk about this found footage movie called VHS. We've all just seen it. VHS consists of six found footage horror films in an anthology, and they're all combined together and directed by different directors within a small indie community. And one of those directors is Joe Swanberg, who is one of the founding fathers of the Mumblecore movement. Mumblecore movement. <laughs> and the best part of VHS is that if you don't like one of the segments, you could just wait 10 minutes and another one's going to start up. So you have six choices to be entertained. I have horror film confusion, okay? Because I saw The Possession, and that to me was a scary movie, and yet people didn't like it that much on Rotten Tomatoes, okay? But I thought it was really well done and scary. This movie, I feel like it's the opposite of those things. It's not as well done, it's not as scary, and people really like it. Well, it's all about how you interpret the concept. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I saw the film and I was like, this is so ridiculous. It must be a satire of horror films. Right. And, and the premise for the film is that these hooligans get hired to steal a VHS tape from someone's house. And it's not really explored, and it's clearly a gimmick. Mm -hmm. And also, it's not really established what year we're in and why they're going to find a VHS tape. Yeah, that's uh, that's part of what I liked about it. I, I mean, yeah. it, it's all about concept versus execution. So the concept of the possession clearly was meant to be scary. Now, right. whether you found it scary or not is for each individual person to decide. This movie, I don't think the point of it is to be scary. If you're searching for VHS tapes and you're watching these, these right. anthology films that are shot on digital cameras or various other devices and somehow wind up on VHS, I don't really take it seriously. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that it's satirizing the found footage genre, which is pretty tired, to be honest. Yeah, but so is satirizing horror films at this point. Like, <laughs> Making this, fun, not this subgenre. Not making, this subgenre. Making fun of a horror film has been done so many times Especially that making this fun year. of a horror film, I'm just yeah. like, oh. We've had like Scream and that awful movie, Cabin, Cabin in the, the Woods. Woods, one of the best movies of the year. <laughs> Terrible film. This is the first one that I've seen has satirized particularly found footage. Films. I guess so, but I still feel like making fun of horror has been done so many times. But I do think we could say generally the quality varies right. from short to short, and there are segments that are stronger than others. Mm -hmm. And for me, the segments that were stronger than others were worth the entire viewing experience. Here was my biggest problem. As soon as you get to the climactic moment where, like, you know, their special effects are not great and things get all flashy and flickery, like, the story gets lost. For instance, the, the sick thing that happened to Emily when she was younger, I believe is the title. Which is, um, is that was the one directed by Joe Swanberg. Which right. doesn't make sense because there's sick things happening to Emily throughout her lifetime, not just when well, she was younger. Well, that's true, so it's a so. misnomer. But the story that I actually really liked up until the end where literally I didn't know what was happening. Like, I lost the plot. The performances, for the most part, were really strong. I they mean, were. These are filmmakers coming from an indie world. They know how to pull great performances out of actors. I think there's a couple standouts just from just from their looks. You have this one girl <laughs> who plays Lily in in Amateur Night, mm -hmm. who's got Hannah these, Fireman. Hannah Fireman, who's got giant these eyes. giant, giant eyes. eyes, who stares at the camera, and she's like, "I like you. I like you. I like, I like you. you. I like you." I thought she was kind of creepy. Oh, she was great. So she creepy. did. She did a wonderful job. And then there's another character, Helen Rogers. My apartment's haunted. It's not haunted. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. <laughs> All of these actors look like real people, and that's my favorite part of the mm. indie world and, and the mumblecore scene, is that you're watching a reflection of you up on the big screen. So we've got six movies, ten directors. The last segment, 103198, which um, is one of my favorites, is directed by a quartet. Mm. Radio Silence. Radio Silence. Right. So you got a lot of people working on this movie, and sometimes when that happens, things tend to go awry. All these guys know their genre really well. I think they're kind of in on what this whole movie is trying to do. And I thought that, that all of them did a nice job, even though the segments do vary 
sometimes considerably in quality. This movie was not that clear, not that scary, but I did like the acting, so for horror fans, I give it a stream it. I thought it was entertaining. I enjoyed the twist of every segment, and I also really like to support the indie world. So I'm going to say, see it. VHS is a fun ride, and found footage horror fans will recognize its satirical elements, so I say, see it. Well, it looks like our votes add up to two and a half tickets, which is a... Where's Rachel? Hmm? I don't know. Rachel? Is Rachel, that... what are you doing? It... I'm hungry. Rachel! <laughs> Hi, I'm Leah, one of the reviewers here at Just Seen It. We know that opinions are very valuable, but they are subject to personal tastes and perspectives. That's why our review process uses a criteria that strives for objectivity instead of subjectivity, so that when we deliver a review, we truly believe that it is a review that you can use. Generally, our criteria involves three different areas. We consider story and writing, acting and casting, directing and production. For story, we look at everything from the logic of the plot to the believability of the premise to the underlying themes. For writing, we're examining the execution of the plot. We're paying attention to the complexity. We're looking at the dialogue, what's being said, how it's being said, the action, and the structure. For casting and acting, we're thinking about do we really buy these actors in these roles in this story? The way we determine this is by looking at the actual actor their skill, their execution, their chemistry with the other players on the screen, and their own physicality. For direction and production, we explore the director's ability to render the story via sight and sound. This involves his or her ability to orchestrate various cinematic elements, such as cinematography and lighting, visual design, setting, costuming, makeup, and of course the use of the actors. The director has to bring all of these elements together so that they fit into a unified, cohesive story. We're also considering whether this is part of a franchise or if it's a reboot or if it belonged in another medium or format before it arrived at the big or the small screen, such as video games or comic books. Sometimes we may find ourselves also recommending something that is seriously flawed, but there is something of value in that work and we think that you'll benefit from seeing it anyway had just seen it, we know that your movie and television viewing time is of a premium. And that's why we work very hard to give you reviews that you can use. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. So much diversity in this week's show. We gave ABC's new fall pilot Nashville a stream it. However, we gave Dread, The Master, and VHS all a see it. So there you go. Three fall movies to go see in the theater while you record Nashville and decide for yourself. Thanks for watching Just Seen It. Judgment time. Just Seen It is brought to you by Short Order and Shortcake, located in the original farmer's market at the corner of 3rd and Fairfax.